Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a review of the complete symphonies of Josef Bohoslav Forster. Who, you might ask? Well, I got to tell you, you know and I know I love unusual repertoire. I love discovering wonderful music by lesser-known composers, because there are some genuine masterpieces out there. There really are. And, you know, they deserve to be heard. Well, Forster wrote none of them. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. Who was Forster? Well, he was a Czech composer. He lived from 1959 to, to uh, 1859, pardon me, 1859 to 1951. Wow. Yes. Uh, he lived to be 91, actually. Um, he was an exact contemporary for most of his life, for some of his life, of Gustav Mahler, and they were friends. And Forster is known for being a friend of Mahler, probably first and foremost, as the composer of the tone poem Cyrano de, Ber de Bergerac, and his fourth symphony, subtitled Easter Eve, which really is his best, and his opera Eva, or Eva, whatever you want to call it. That's what he did, but he wrote tons of music. He lived for a long time. He wrote five symphonies in all, and they're all recorded here on, on CPO uh, with the Osnabrück Symphony Orchestra under Hermann Boimer. He's the conductor. Now, I have actually um, reviewed several of these at classicstoday.com, and you can run over and read those reviews. They're free reviews. They're there for all of you. Um, and I was able to listen to the other performances when this box came out on, on MD&G. That's the label, actually. But I got to tell you, this guy was no symphonist. And the problem really wasn't that he didn't know what symphonies were supposed to be. It was his own personal style. And it's interesting to compare him, actually, to his contemporaries and, you know, the composers who were sort of in his league. I mean, if you think about it, there was, there was, you know, well, obviously there was Dvorak, who was quite a bit older, but then there was Josef Suk and, and Vitislav Novak, for example, and Janacek. He, he just has less personality than all of them. <laughs> Zdenek Fibich, even. Fibich wasn't exactly the most characterful and colorful of, of composers either. But the problem with this is that, is that Furster has no, it has, his music has no muscle. It's flabby. It's kind of a cross between, well, you hear Czechishness in it. You hear Czechitude or Czechosity, whatever you want to call it. It has the occasional sort of folky dvorak -y sound to it. But then it's mostly chromatic sludge a la Wagner, that sort of thing. And that's always a bad idea when you mix it with, with actual folk music and you don't have any other major personal qualities. Um, for example, I mean, Janicek is Janicek, obviously, you know, and Dvorak was Dvorak. But let's take, let's take two of the other rarities. Josef Suk, who was not terribly prolific, you know, he was Dvorak's son-in-law, but he was writing at the same time that Forster was writing his late symphonies, the 1920s, 1910s. His music has, has so much more intensity, so much more rhythm, and a much, much greater sort of linear contrapuntal fiber to it. It has toughness. And that makes a huge difference, especially when you're writing big, long symphonic poems, which is what Sook was writing at the end of his life. Or Novak. Novak was a very, uh, really much closer to Forster than Sook was. He was kind of, I, I referred to both of them as sort of Czech deliuses. They did a lot with nature, a lot with this sort of, sort of pastoral imagery. Um, and they didn't write music that had a, a tremendous amount of, 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 of hardness to the sound. It's very, very dreamy often, very impressionistic even. But the fact of the matter is that Novak, first of all, had a very personal melodic style. Second of all, he was also a very good contrapuntist, but he wanted to be. Thirdly, he was a very, very fine orchestrator, much better than Forster. And so, again, it's all a question of comparisons. You hear this stuff next to other people's stuff, and it just isn't as good. The symphonies especially, you know, I've, I've heard quite a bit of Forster, at least what's been out. Cyrano de Bergerac, his big tone poem, that works. 
He wrote some suites and overtures. They're lovely. He was good as a miniaturist, but when he had to write these large symphonic forms, things that have overall shape, a, a narrative sort of trajectory that isn't as abstract, but it's a trajectory. You know, you know where it's going, you know where it's ending. I mean, Forster had no clue how to write an ending. It's so odd. You listen to some of these pieces and they stop and then they start up again and then they have a coda. It's, it's very, very strange that, you know, he didn't notice that. He, he didn't quite figure that out. So the first two symphonies are sort of conservative, you know, Dvorak meets more, you know, Richard Strauss sort of thing. And, and the third is, is, is more transitional on its way to the fourth, the Easter Eve, which is a lovely work. It is absolutely his best symphony. It's very, very beautiful and has wonderful, you know, thematic material. Um, it's very lucidly scored, but like all of his music, it doesn't really go anywhere. It doesn't have any, any, any hardness to it, any drive, any firmness. Although it, it, that symphony has more than most, certainly more than the Fifth Symphony, which apparently he worked on for five years and was very important to him because it was written in the wake of the death of his only son. And so it's, it's deeply moving, but nothing happens. And that's the problem. The performances, I think, could also have a little bit more, a little bit more fiber. They could be a little stronger, a little bit more rhythmic. The brass playing could be a little bit more exciting. I don't think the music is quite as droopy as these performances make it out to be. Some of them are better than others, but basically I, they're all a little bit on the slow and cautious side. Um, and sometimes Forster can be very difficult. I mean, you know, he gave the players plenty to do. He was a late romantic and he knew how to write for the orchestra um, in terms of the player's capabilities. Um, if the overall sound that he evokes doesn't have quite the sheen or the character of his, of his compatriots, well, neither does his thematic invention. I mean, he just didn't have that. He simply didn't. Um, also, I, I must say, we have here the, the Forrester symphonies, one through five, plus the suite in the, in the mountains, which is very nice. It's the early, very pretty work. Romantic, a little faceless, yeah, okay, but very nice. It's not a symphony, thank God. But here it says, complete orchestral works, which this assuredly is not. It really isn't. So, so what are we going to do with this? Well, I, I feel guilty not loving it. I really do because I really want to push this stuff. But, you know, it doesn't make any sense to push second-rate material. You're just not going to like me. And I want you to like me. So I would try the Fourth Symphony. There's a very good performance of it on Naxos. Um, and you can get it. And there's a new Forster cycle with... Um, with uh, Mark, uh, what's his name? Mark Stielitz, or Yerzy Stielitz's son. I know the father. For years, he ran Super Fun Records, so I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit, I get confused. But it's Maestro Stielitz. He just came out with the first symphony and a couple other works, and I'm listening to that now. We'll see what, how that turns out, if it changes my opinion of the music. But you, know, you can get the fourth symphony, and it, it, Smetichek recorded it, and there are a couple others, and they're, they're, it, it's fine. That's where you start. If you like it, okay. Maybe you'll want to get some more of them, um, but I doubt it. <laughs> I really strongly doubt it. So, uh, so you know, sometimes it's just, just the way it turns out, folks. What can I tell you? Keep on listening, and thanks so much for joining me. Take care.